Okay. All right. We're, we're ready. We're ready to start, everyone. Hey, guys. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming to our panel. We're BioWare, and you guys are the audience. You're, you're joining us. It's a panel. I didn't prepare this part. We prepared the whole panel, and I didn't prepare the introduction. But that doesn't matter, because no one cares about me. We care about you Aww. and the people to my left. I'm Jessica Marizin, Community Manager at BioWare, and I'm going to let everyone introduce themselves because I will forget everyone's name, even though they're near and dear to my heart. But we're going to talk today about romance, something that is awesome and <laughs> something... And you're in dear to your heart? It's very dear to my heart. It's dear to a lot of parts of me. <laughs> Are there any babies in here? <laughs> is anyone under 18? Because we're a rated mature game. No, the whole con is under 18. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's our kind of con. This is our kind of con. Yeah. All right. Well, let's have everyone introduce themselves. We've got a lot to cover. Let's start with you, David. I remembered your name. <laughs> it's good. Because we care about you, Jessica. We do. Give me a hug. Aww. This is already a very different Gamer X than last year. <laughs> it was like, they're like an old married couple. <laughs> it's true. Uh, my name's David Gator. I'm the lead writer for the Dragon Age series. Uh, I've been with Bioware for 15 years, and sometimes it feels like romance is all I ever think about or do. It's not true, but there are moments. Indeed. Hi, I'm Karen Weeks. I am lead editor at BioWare, so I work on both franchises with my awesome team of editors. I've been at BioWare for nine years, and I'm so excited to be here. If I could ask you guys a favor, a lot of people we work with are working really hard on a game up in Edmonton. Can I take, ask you guys to wave and so we can say hi to all the devs up in Edmonton? One, two, three. Good job. <laughs> Rock on. Thank you very much. <laughs> Go. <laughs> Hi, I'm Patrick Weeks. I'm a writer. I'm uh, one of Dave's minions, and I've worked at Bioware for ten, ten, I guess, years. So and you know me, and not you. Wow. Well, okay. Um, on both the we are an old married couple, by the way. The Mass Effect <laughs> franchise, and now on Dragon Age Inquisition. Hello, I'm Robin Taberge, and my title is Development Manager, but I like to say the easiest way to describe what I do is I'm a professional enabler. So <laughs> I get to work with these guys and the rest of the disciplines um, at BioWare. I've been there for four years. I've been on both projects, and I've worked with every discipline, including all of the wonderful writers and editors. Um, and yeah, I'm the grease in the pipes. I keep things going and make sure we deliver um, on time, at quality, and on budget. So let's just cut right through the bullshit. Am I allowed to cuss on this panel? Yes. 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 Oh my gosh. This is the, oh, I was just like, I'm verklempt. <laughs> that was not English. I let's verklempt. cut through the bullshit and th let's talk about how we make romances. In uh, games. In games. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right. Always editing. <laughs> Always needing it. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be a gif. All right. Uh, so yeah, we, I originally asked for this panel uh, because I wanted to put out uh, amongst my people uh, the idea that we are open to feedback on the romances, and I want to establish some ground rules, and one of those ground rules is I need you to, to know how, how they are made first. Uh, and so, talking about the, how the romances are physically constructed, we've been doing romances of one type or another since Baldur's Gate 2. So that, was the, that came out in 99, so it's been, it's been quite a while. Uh, I've been involved in a lot of those. The, the basic structure is uh, you start with the flirting. There has to be a friendship arc that exists that is independent of the romance for that character because that character has to exist for those people who don't romance him 
or her, and they have to get to know that person. But in, in the, the context of that friendship arc, there will come a point, and in game terms, that is the, this is the player telling us, the writers, hey, I would like to romance this character. That is the, the flirt, the flirting option. That's, 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 that's the signal that goes to us, huh, this person is interested in this character. And that sets a number of flags, which, which next time you talk to them, it's like if, if, this, if this character has been flirted with, we proceed to the romance arc. Would anybody like Set to continue to flirt that? Too? Yes. Yes. Patrick, would you like to sure. continue that thought? Um, and then everything spider webs uncontrollably into chaos. <laughs> is, um, <laughs> Um, as someone who is currently working through um, a romance arc, I think it's important to note how many different conditions we have, uh, how many conditionals, that's our, our term for the logic gates that test whether something is true and uh, tell the computer, tell the system, which line of dialogue should be fired. Yeah. So the usual, um, in a, a completely normal, nothing special about it romance, which is none of them because they are all special snowflakes in different ways. And we always say this time it's gonna be by a system and they will all do that and they never do. But it always has something that says if you flirt enough times, then you get your opt-in and the opt-in lets you start the romance. And then depending on the romance date, they're starting the romance, the romance is active, you've had the talk that says, okay, just to confirm player, you said you liked me, but do you like, like me, like me? <laughs> okay, you do, awesome, great. And the next time you talk, it's okay, so you've confirmed that you like me, like me, are you prepared to like me instead of liking anybody else? <laughs> okay, good. And then, so it goes through these states of going, okay, so now, now we've said the romance has started, now it's exclusive. Right. Now it's culminated. Yeah. <laughs> well, there is the romance story, right? Every character, it's, every time we do a romance, uh, it starts with the writer deciding what kind of romance story they'd like to tell. That's, that's the genesis, right? Do I want to tell a story where uh, this is a person that has, has uh, uh, had romantic difficulties in the past? Is this, a, I, want to, I, want to, I want to do a dom romance or, you know, like, uh, uh, what kind of tale do we want to tell? I mean, I, I say Dom Romance, I joke, because that's, that's just about sex. It doesn't have to be just about sex, right? There, there is the, the, the type of relationship that we're going for. Uh, is this a, like where uh, there's a betrayal element and you have to decide whether or not you forgive that person. So once you've gotten past the do you like me, like me, are we ready to start the romance story now? Then we start the, the we call it gating, but really what it boils down to is pacing. How do we spread the romance story across the game? Because it's, it's, it's not a game about romance. Some people might feel differently on that topic, but it's not actually about romance. There's it, this it whole is, other story going on. It's Sorry. a romance with a small, you know, save the world mini game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and maybe some combat quick time events. Yeah. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but we have to sort of, sp how do we spread that story over the course of the rest of the game? And so we'll look for things like approval. Uh, I know that some people said, well, it's like uh, inserting approval coins until you get back the, the I love you, right? Uh, some would say, it's, 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 it's so gamey. That's because it is it's a game. game. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not to say it couldn't possibly be done better, and that's the reason for this panel. So. It, the gating is done by, say, approval. If we need to play the game to get thing, either things or have conversations with this character to increase that, that number, which is their approval, until you hit, hit that ding moment where it's like, okay, we're ready for conversation number two, and Alistair gives you a flower. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the, the gating mechanism. Or it could be we gate it by crit path events. So once you have done this, this plot, which we know, we know from the way the rest of the game goes, that'll happen about mid-game. Okay, so we make sure that that can't happen until we've hit that plot. So the player has had some plot of their experience, just to make sure they're not having, you know, one really long conversation and it's like, romance done, and then they have the rest of the game to do. We want to want to spread it out a little bit. Uh, but that is the, the, the essential of how we put together a romance. And I think probably what more, more people are interested in is uh, how we put together a romance, say for Inquisition in particular. Uh, one of the questions that probably gets brought up is how do we decide who is romanced? 
Yeah? I don't know, that didn't seem enthusiastic. Maybe they don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Moving they on. Care. To, yeah. <laughs> Are you trying to turn this into like a cheerleading rally? <laughs> 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 How pumped are you for how we put the romances together in Inquisition? <laughs> uh, I think there is a bit of a misperception that uh, we start off by saying this person is going to be the romance by this, like this will be the straight romance, this will be the gay romance, or, or whatever the case may be. There is a point, like we start making the characters and they change a lot initially. I think in Inquisition is especially, we went through this, this long process where, okay, this character existed for a long time and now they've disappeared into the ether because we decided, mm, no. And then there's a sitting down with the artist, let's say, and saying, well, what kind of character do you want, do characters do you want to draw? And they decide, well, they don't want the frog man. And I'm like, okay, well, we weren't, that, wasn't, that wouldn't have made for a good romance anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Although you know somebody would have run a romance <laughs> soon, for sure. Uh, but we, we, at some point we sit down and we're thinking, okay, now we've got this array of characters that we've decided on. And then the discussion starts on, well, this writer is sort of interested in writing the character and they say, mm, I kind of thinking this would be kind of cool for a straight romance because I have this particular thing in mind. And we want to, there's also a conversation of, well, we want to make sure there's enough options for everybody who's playing the game, so we're thinking of the player experience. So there's a bit of back and forth negotiation. Uh, is that, you, you, even you guys are part of that. Like, it's, it's not just the writers who are part of that discussion. The editors will be part of it, uh, a VO is part of it, uh, the, the, the production team, the, the, the managers, everybody is sort of putting their two cents in and in, in, in kind of, like what they would like to see. And it's not necessarily, it's not in terms of, well, I think that character looks straight. <laughs> or I think that character, uh, he's pretty gay. Uh, there, it, this, the, this conversation starts a lot earlier than that, probably even before we're seeing like a solid visual concept for the character. Probably before we, we've fully settled on, like we have, we have a, probably have a good idea of what their story is going to be, but we haven't really detailed out the, the complete arc at that point yet. Uh, would you say And sometimes correct? it's, you know, we, we move things from game to game. Um, you know, Dragon Age is number three in the series, and so it's, you know, taking a character Someone that someone's interested that maybe had a smaller role in a previous game and figuring out you know what's what's new about their story, what's different, and oftentimes we're incorporating feedback from thing discussions just like this. You know what ideas have we heard about from fans that we want to incorporate, or you know what what new ideas do we want to work in, and we start kind of weaving all those threads together and seeing what character will fit with this idea that we had had and how it all comes together. I I think something um, as uh, the ostensibly straight guy um, on the panel, I think it's one thing that we have to, as writers, be aware of and kind of try to strike a balance on within ourselves is sometimes I will write um, a character for, for a romance and I will say, okay, I know this was this was written as this was written to be a romanceable by male player or male PCs or female PCs, but this one really just kind of feels like it only really works with the female PCs, and it's it's huff, it's hard to get it's hard to be objective on that, and it's important to kind of rely on the other writers and the rest of the room and really the rest of the team to say, is that just me? Am I? Am I putting my own, um, you know, straight guy values on that? Like, I can't see that working from this other side. Or is this something where it's like, no, actually, it is important to this relationship uh, that this character only be attracted to one gender or another. And I think doing that, having those limitations, um, lets us tell stories that have, okay, this actually is a, a same-sex relationship. This actually wouldn't work if it was just a, uh, just a het relationship. Yeah, I say that's fair. I mean, uh, if you've done any writing, there is a point at which the character starts to develop a life of their own. And that, that's, that's true for far more than sexuality. There comes a point where it doesn't matter whether we're talking about the romances, where I'm writing the character and it's like, mm, you know, I just don't think, I know the plot requires them to do this thing, 
but I, I just don't feel like that's going to work. And there, there, that could be a, a, a conversation sometime. It's like, dude, just get over it <laughs> and make it happen. But I mean, uh, that doesn't happen very often because it's like you, it, it comes to a point where you have to respect the process, right? Mm -hmm. And the process is not, well, uh, uh, we require this character to have this sexuality and that's going to happen come hell or high water. It, it is like, okay, when we reach a point, and it, it has happened, where a writer has said, I, I just don't feel like I'm doing this romance justice. Is, is there a way we can accommodate? And, and there might be another, another uh, writer who's like, oh, you know what? Uh, I think that would be cool that the character I'm doing, it would be great if they were bisexual. That, that would totally work for them. And it's like, okay, let, 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 let's do that and, and try to work around and, and look, and, you know, we have the, the chart. <laughs> we do. We have no, the we chart. We have some amazing it's meetings really, about this. Really you guys big. have no and idea. And the, the chart, yeah. the chart incidentally is what we're looking at. Uh, okay, it, it, for the players of various types, what options do they have? And looking for breadth in that those options, right? Like a, it, at the minimum, it's two people. But if it's just two, do those two characters represent sort of different types of, of romance stories? And so we, you know, we take that, those names off the chart. Now we're we're flipping it around. It's like, okay, what's what's our breadth? And it's like. Uh, all right, no, 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 that's not going to work because uh, suddenly if you're a dwarf gay male, you're totally screwed. Or, or whatever, or right? Not. Or not. Or exactly. not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Said all three of them. Yeah. yeah. Um, trying to figure out exactly where, where we lie on, on that point. But yeah, this, characters, uh, there is a point at which uh, the character isn't always going to do what we want, and I know I know that there is often uh, some disappointment because people are like, well, I really had my heart set on that particular character being this particular way. Uh, the, the process doesn't always lend itself to that. So we will. It, it's about writing stories that that we need to tell. Yeah, and I think the other part of that is just hoping that we have the trust from enough of the players to know that we have. We've hit that pretty rigorously, and yeah. it is it is really only when we genuinely feel and have kind of gotten you know the feel from the room like no okay that one really does need to be this type of romance this should only be a same sex this should only be a straight romance um, whereas uh, you know a lot of times if it's just like okay well I really you know when I play these scenes in my head I'm pretty much seeing this as a straight romance but I don't think it doesn't work as a same-sex romance, so I'm just gonna make it for both. And if there are people out there who are, who are like awesome with that as same-sex romance, that's fantastic. Um, so I'm not going to gate it unless I actually feel it needs to happen. Um, you know, if it's, if it's important to the story for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think that, that uh, that's a good segue into, uh, we changed the process a bit from Dragon Age 2. Dragon Age 2, we had four romances in total. And what I had said at that point was, okay, since we have so few romance stories in total, they're all going to be bisexual, just to make sure that uh, every, every player had some type of choice. And the thing is uh, that ultimately I, didn't, I don't think bisexuality is a great compromise because bisexuality itself is not a compromise. Uh, but in terms of gameplay, we, can't, we couldn't deny that, okay, uh, the way we did Origins where we had one bisexual character and one straight one for each each uh, gender of character did not really make for the feeling that, that uh, uh, gay and bisexual players were sort of on even ground with everyone else. And so we, we did that in DA2 with the four, four romances. It ends up that in Inquisition, we got the go ahead to include a lot more total romances. So the decision was made, okay, then we don't, we don't need to compromise. So we were going to have straight, straight romances alongside bisexual romances alongside gay romances. And I thought that was, that was pretty important because those are different stories to tell. Okay, I just wanted to add in a little of, of what I find a rather amusing and fabulous um, technical side of this because we have all these characters and all these romance arcs. And part of my job is to work with our um, translators because our games get translated into approximately eight other languages and to work with our QA team because the QA team has to test all of these romances and if they work and if the conditionals are firing. So we literally have a chart called who's doing who. <laughs> <laughs> And it's got circles, and it's all different colors, and it's just this <laughs> rainbow of amazing. And it's really helpful, but yeah, so it, it does lead to the who's doing who chart, which is, I guess, a perk of working at Bioware, because it's really fun <laughs> to be checking all that. And 
I don't know if this is a natural segue, but I, we did get clearance to announce uh, one thing. Go ahead. For the um, first time. Get the Twitter out. <laughs> 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 that, um, so one of the followers that I was working on, um, the Iron Bull, is um, is uh, anyone who read his Q and A saw that he has a a kind of a, a larger than life lifestyle. He's very enthusiastic. I and I recall I, I wrote something to the effect of he he'll overeat, he'll drink till he passes out, and he'll happily hop into bed with anyone that he's reasonably sure he won't break. Um, and and people read that in a variety of different ways. Um, uh, which and in fact I had written that specifically with that wiggle room because... Because um, he's tricksy. One of the things you may have noticed <laughs> if you've seen the Iron Bull is that he's freaking huge. He it, is bigger than your average canary. Like, literally, his rig is bigger than... He has other his own rigs, unique... So to speak. ...about the size of a Golem model. Yes. Yeah. And um, for a while, we were looking at the possibility of romances with him, but we honestly weren't sure whether it was going to work from an animation perspective. <laughs> Um, you guys remember that poor dwarf we were talking about before? Yeah. We needed a lot of wiggle room. Lots so, of yeah. <laughs> so um, as of earlier in the week, thanks to the Herculean efforts of um, John Epler, who's a cine designer who was working on the Iron Bull and is a very, very awesome person. Let me point out, I'll just jump in. The cinematic designers, this is the point of the project. Like, we get to come here because we're basically done and we're on oh, vacation. Yeah. Woo! <laughs> The cinematic designers are the people who are at the end of the pipeline, who are currently working their asses off, working long hours. Every day they come in, those, those circles are a little bit deeper. Those are the people you were waving to. That yeah. will go. John, John Epler was a cinematic designer who went above and beyond yeah. because he thought, well, you know, I want to make sure that this character uh, has, has, is, is romanceable by as many different types of people as possible. And, uh, and thanks to his insane work, um, I had to remove a couple of lines of dialogue explaining why the Iron Bull wouldn't romance you, and no matter what gender or race you pick, you will not break. <laughs> <laughs> I remember uh, very distinctly when one of our trailers came out and there's kind of the party shot and you can clearly see the scale of Iron Bull compared to the rest of the the rest of the species, so the elves and the, and the humanoids and that. And the voice actor, Freddie Prince Jr., sent us an email. I, I worked on vo VO in this game. Um, he sent us an email and he's like, wow, I'm huge. <laughs> <laughs> and then we sent back a bunch of vulgar jokes. But, <laughs> but yeah, he was, uh, he was pretty impressed uh, that's, that's with what we one pulled of things, off for him. Yeah, that's I'd one of the things we haven't run into yeah, a, a more lot. More about what he brought, because he was... Yeah. Yeah, Hello, Freddie Burns Jr. Um, he's been in our games before. He played James Vega in Mass Effect 3, and he's a huge Whoa. game fan. Yeah. He brings more to the table than a lot of VO actors do because he, he plays them. He understands how it works. He understands how these romance arcs function because he's been in there. And um, he, uh, his voice, that's all him. That's Freddie Prince Jr. putting on Iron Bull, the character. That's not processed, maybe a tiny bit pitched down, but <laughs> that is a character that he created, a voice that's completely unique for Iron Bull. So this is, Iron Bull is who he is because of what, what Freddie also brought to the table, looking at what Patrick had written. He's kind of put his own spin on it, and like you said, they definitely do get a life of their own, <laughs> especially when you start roping in um, some more parties. I, I was... Um, yes. I, I was in the booth with uh, Freddie Prince Jr. the day that he was, and I've got to say... I'm not sure you were invited to that. You may have just kind of wandered in. <laughs> she, <laughs> she's, she's All That was a very formative movie for me. Um, Any female in the 90s, I think. Watched yeah. that 50 and, times. Uh, people, uh, yeah. I, think, I think the Iron Bull romance is going to, um, it's going to affect a lot of people. Based it's on... It's gonna leave a dent, let me say that. Yeah. <laughs> Based on my time in the booth with Freddy, I think, I think you guys are going to enjoy it. Uh, VO, bringing up VO is actually a good point. I mean, uh, there's, there's several aspects when we approach writing characters 
And a lot of times we get asked, well, how does it change once you know the character is going to be a romance? Does it change how they're written? Does it change how they look? And does it change how they sound? And those are, those are excellent questions. Because the answer is uh, essentially yes to all three. Maybe not as much as you might think, but it has to be there in the back of your mind. It's like, it's like uh, for the character artists. You know, they, they might send a, a character concept or something and I have to go to them and say, look, somebody has to want to kiss this character. Somebody <laughs> has to want to kiss this character. Not that you necessarily need to make them look a supermodel. And that's, there's a drawn out sort of process where you have to sort of uh, chase your own tail a bit, right? It's like, well, we don't want, what are we saying by how we are making them look? Like, because there's also the element of, of, uh, of uh, we're, we're saying something about, about uh, uh, not, not just sexuality, but, but the, the nature of what is good looking, right? I think there was one really funny moment where as we were kind of going around and looking at the romance possibilities and the Iron Bull was introduced as a possibility and it was like, really, you think someone's gonna wanna do that? And, <laughs> and it was like, I know I'm a straight guy, but I'm pretty sure <laughs> that yes. <laughs> I'm reasonably confident I can make that work. <laughs> oh, come oh, on. We could, have, we could have a mailbox in the game and somebody would want to do it. <laughs> That's true. Sorry, Robin, for you. <laughs> yeah, but, I mean, you've got... Is it interesting when people, when you're asking people to do romances, um, like actors, you know, Same. like what, what they bring to the table in terms of some of the romantic moments or the... Well, I think on DAI, um, a lot of the actors didn't know what the romance options were until they got to the session with those lines. <laughs> they, they, are, they play a role and they capture that character. Um, and then when, when we get to the session um, where we, we hit the romances or the culminations, um, we, we bring in the writers <laughs> who, wrote the, who wrote the dialogue for uh, that character. And we'll also bring in the cine designers that we talked about who are animating the scenes um, and the conversations that you're going to have with your romance option. And um, we get them all in the booth um, in Edmonton. <laughs> and they do a little Skype connection to the VO booth wherever uh, the actor is recording. And uh, everybody just kind of looks at it, okay, like, well, does this person need to be tender? Do they need to be tough, you know? Is this my badass daddy type? Or is this, you know, my, my soft shoulder to cry on? You know, that sort of thing. So, um, and the actors, they, uh, they kind of love those sessions, oh, yes. I think. Yes, they do. I think they really love them. <laughs> uh, I think they love how uncomfortable never... it makes us, because there's always that moment of like, okay, so. so okay, Mr. Prince. Because you have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> how okay the actor is going yeah. to be with this necessarily, right? So mm -hmm. you sort of bring it up and you flow it. It's like, okay, so, you know, we've talked a little bit about this before, but your character is gay. <laughs> 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 and I... Yeah. Like super gay. Super gay. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I just love that, that the response is terrible, like, oh, excellent, awesome. Great. <laughs> and then they just charge on ahead. But how many, what kind of sex do we have to have? Oh, no, 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 it's not that kind of game. <laughs> I think we hit a couple of Patrick lines um, in an earlier session with Iron Bull. And uh, out of context, some of them are quite interesting. So it's like a line or two, you know, whatever's ready, whatever Karen has had the chance to edit. You know, um, there's so many dependencies. So whenever things get shuffled our way, we record them um, with them. And there are some that came up out of context for Iron Bull. And he's like, okay, what am I doing here? <laughs> and I remember Caroline telling him, 50 shades of bull, go. <laughs> Amazingly, that direction totally works. <laughs> yeah. that, that's not the first time that that term has been spoken. I think, yeah, I, I think that was the day I was there and I'm pretty sure his response was, all right, let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> um, Robin, maybe you can tell us, uh, when, when it comes down, like once we've reached the, the, the sort of the final decisions of who's going to be romanceable, I know that the, the casting process starts earlier than that. Mm -hmm. does, the pro does it actually, the, the information of, okay, this character is romanceable, does that change the casting process at all? Uh, definitely, and in different ways, depending on the character, but you need to be able to make sure that um, that they're going to fit the needs of, of that role. So, <laughs> duh. <Okay. laughs> um, but, so, 
Um, a couple of examples I can think of. So you want to make sure that, like in this game, um, so in our in our follower group, you want to make sure that there's there's variety. So if you have you know three straight options, couple of buys, and a couple of gays, you want them like Dave was saying, you want them to hit all over the map. And so when we look at our casting and we're looking at like okay, here's the final balance of our romances. Do we have any gaps? Is there somebody that, like, you know, there's the same, they're kind of, eh, you know, they're not interesting. By changing uh, the direction of the casting, we can have a bigger impact on that. Like I said, you know, um, Freddie Prince Jr. has brought a lot to the table for his character. Um, a lot of the voice actors for our follower parties, the same thing. Like, they really become these people. They are recording, hmm, on average, about 300 lines in a four-hour session, and they have multiple sessions over the game. So they really get to spend a lot of time being this character, and you just want to make sure that it's well-balanced. And um, a lot of the voices um, can sound the same, and you want to make sure that, that there's that dynamic kind of line amongst the voices to make them distinct. Um, it's especially important um, in our games because you're often with your party and you know we've got some really great banter. And it's, a, it's really good to have that variety in the voices so that you, you know who that is. You don't have to look at your HUD to tell you who's speaking. You know who that is because you can you very distinctly have a very different character with each voice. And it's kind of fun as we start hearing the voices, writing and, and editing too, as we're going through, <laughs> having that voice in your head really helps. And we have, there's usually a loop where, you know, they can't kind of, they'll record the first part of things and then we're going through and then it changes a little bit. And sometimes you have to change a few of the first things because what they brought to the character affects how we're hearing them in our heads when we're writing and editing. And it's a neat kind of symbiosis when it starts working. It's cool. It's that, I like that there's that, kind of magical time in development where we haven't locked down the writing yet, but the voiceover has started. Yeah. The mm -hmm. recording, when, when you can hear that, because then you have the chance to go, oh, they can do that. Okay, I bet this line would, they would knock this one out of the park. Or I wrote, yeah, I wrote this line and, okay, I wrote it this way, but oh, if I change this word, suddenly it's a much better line with the way they've been reading. Remember when Luke discovered that Rowan Addison, who is uh, Sarah's <laughs> voice actress, had the most awesome giggle snort. Mm. Yeah. Oh yeah, Robin Addison's laugh Robin is Addison, infectious. Yeah. It's like, so I could infectious. listen to it all day. So it's suddenly fabulous. Sarah is just laughing everywhere in the game. <laughs> uh, anyway, this is, a, this is a pretty good segue. Uh, the, the main purpose I wanted to, to, to have this, like I said, was to get some feedback. I mean, we get a lot of feedback online, uh, but I just wanted to, to throw open the floor for questions uh, or, or even, even uh, to address concerns or offer suggestions over uh, how we can do romances a little bit better or what you'd like to see more of. Because um, uh, I, I can say, having worked on romances for as long as I have, there is a bit of deliberateness to the way we go about it. That it, it, it sometimes is beneficial to look at pe people who who can offer some different perspectives and say, uh, "Well, why don't you do do this?" And we can stop for a moment and think, "Okay, maybe the Bioware way, all capitalized, is not the only way that this could possibly be done." So, if anybody has some thoughts to share with us, that would be great. Uh, right there in the hat. Yep, you. <laughs> Um, so I've noticed that oftentimes in Dragon Age games when you try to romance multiple characters, <laughs> they become sort of like, oh, well, what are you doing? And it ends up being kind of a sketchy thing that you can either evade the answer to or just be flat out like, oh, I'm with someone else. Um, have you guys thought about, or what are the possibilities of having an open, consensual polyamory You're talking about polyamory? Yeah. Okay, there's a good reason why we don't do that. Because oh, yeah. the scripting destroys you. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, that, that legitimately uh, is the that, reason. That is, that is the reason. I have answered this question before. Yeah. Uh, we have considered and probably will consider in the future having a polyamorous relationship, but if we did, it would have to be characters that are set up to only be rela have a relationship that is polyamorous. Like two people who are already in a relationship and you can, you can join as a third if they're already open or something similar to that. Is that yes. Yes. We're, we're definitely not opposed. It's not something that, that we have a problem with on any level beyond the scripting has broken us every yeah, time we've tried. Yeah. Cool, awesome, thank you. Okay, Jessica's running around. Oh, Jessica around. Has, is doing the running, Whoa. awesome. Ooh. Uh, one, in regards to Iron Bowl, my body is ready. Um, <laughs> <laughs> two, sorry, I wanted to go back to what you were saying about everyone in Dragon Age 2 being homosexual. Um, in terms of, like, in terms of like actually reflecting bi identities, right? Because mm -hmm. they're so erased, even in queer media, 
mm. um, because of just uncomfortable bullshit that they get from gigs and West Games and all sorts of other people. Um, <laughs> are we having West Side Story moment? Is that yeah, happening? there was some snapping uh, going on. But I'm thinking of like Isabella, for example, who I just want to be when I grow up. Uh, right. It, yeah. I feel like she actually has kind of a bi identity as opposed mm-hmm. to being hawk sexual. Like she's very clearly like I'm into whatever. I'm not. I'm very not very cool personally with the the term hawk sexual, player sexual. Some people use. I know. I know it's it's handy because it, it actually refers to it from a gameplay perspective. Uh, I know when it, it, it first got to start started getting thrown around our forums, for instance, uh, it re- referred mostly to the element of that some of the romances were ambiguous. Isabella's uh, sexuality is not ambiguous, but you go to the other side of that, Meryl's is. She never refers to it. So if you wanted to think of her as straight, you could. If you wanted to think of her as gay, you could. Um, but the, the idea that I think gets a little bit destructive is that some people use player sexual, and I'm not saying that you are. Uh, they use it in the terms of that their sexuality actually changes according to who is romancing them. I mean, that means that then they are either straight or gay, and that is by erasure because that means that by that by definition means bisexuality does Just, not exist. If I, I can, if I can jump in. Wait. Oh, oh, sorry. Go that, ahead. Like that was the core of my question, right? Is like how do you draw that line between yeah. Yeah. establishing a character as having a bi identity right. and not just falling into that trap that you just. And I, mm-hmm. and I think one of the things that we like is, you know, Isabella is definitely bisexual, you know, whether, how, whether you romance her as male hawk, female hawk, or if you don't romance her. Right. And, you know, we've, uh, we've done the same thing with, uh, with Iron Bull. He's, he's a person who is quite happy in joining the company of both genders. And All talks genders. about it he's outside pan. of the he's context of the yeah, romance. He's pan. He's yeah. pan. Uh, so uh, but part of that is, is when we write, like when we wrote the DA2 romances, we wrote them knowing that they were bisexual and with that in mind. Uh, they, they talked about it to differing degrees, so there was breadth in the portrayal, but there's only so far we, we can go down with that. And so part of what is great about having uh, the situation in Inquisition where we had enough breadth that we could include specific identities is that we can have them talk specifically about their sexuality in, in context and that you know we could talk about the bisexual identity specifically. We could talk about the gay identity specifically, and not have to worry about needing to leave any room for ambiguity on the part of the player. Whether I mean uh, it's arguable as to whether that ambiguity was actually helpful to begin with. I know some people liked it, some people really hated it. So there's argument, but I mean uh, for us the ability to t- actually tell different stories with these characters is better because we didn't we don't want to tell a bunch a bunch of only bisexual stories either that that that's not that's not representation well they're they're not just their sexualities yes. but their sexualities are a part of them yeah. and when you leave that ambiguous you're weakening them as characters i think yeah i think that was where where we ultimately landed Great talk so far. Um, I was wondering, uh, earlier when you described how the, uh, the, story, the romance arcs work, um, it was entirely from the point of view of dialogue choices. Uh, have you guys done much thought into having other game mechanics also inform the romances? Uh, what do you mean? I don't know, maybe somebody really only likes romancing rich people, therefore you have to earn enough money, or there's a stat oh, oh. check. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Perhaps you really do have to be strong enough not to break for him to romance. You're people. talking about having other types of gating other than gender. Yeah, then, basically, yeah. something outside of dialogue system. Uh, yes, we have some gate. Some romances in DAI are gated by the player race, for instance, uh, which which Iron Bull was uh, for for uh, logistical reasons until that uh, until John Epler threw himself on that grenade. Uh, so yeah, so I mean, there is there's other things we could do, like say uh, only romance the character who say supports Templars or mages or things like that, and that would be realistic, but. Uh, the, the problem at the end of the day is that a lot of times doing what's, what is more realistic or, or uh, adding more variation into the romance, it, it means that we have to write more. Uh, and there is only so much writing that we can do. Writing is very <laughs> expensive. Uh, we have to, how many languages are we in, Robin? Uh, Fulvio hey. language is German, uh, English. And French, but that's then the VO, game. and then we have to translate to more. Yeah, get translated. And then I it translates Japanese and Italian and Spanish Portuguese. and Portuguese and English oh, French so German. many. So yeah, uh, the never, <laughs> that's that's just the the physical cost of that. There's also the more lines we do, the more cinematics have to be included. The it, it's it's a long line, so we do have a budget in terms of this is how many words the writers have to work with. And if we, if we added, that would mean cutting somewhere else, yes. probably within that same romance. Yeah, 
That is to say that we did ask for feedback, so that's an awesome idea. Thank yeah, you. No, 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 no. That's <laughs> I, I, want, I want to say that we have often talked about it, and that there, there's something to be said about uh, uh, maybe we, the, we don't need to have romances be automatically successful and maybe have more failure conditions, that you could actually fail a romance and that you need to work a little harder to get through it, and it's not just... Okay, uh, I saying, do you like me, like me? Okay, that means we're going to start the romance and we're automatically going to get to the end. That is something that we have considered as well, so it's, I, I think it's definitely a possibility. Yeah. Run, run, run! <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we talk about a lot of the sexualities, but are you guys considering writing like an asexual romance? <gasps> <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that would look like, and that—that—that's that, that, just speaking for me personally. Uh, I think there would have to be a conversation over how we would approach that, and not just, okay, an asexual romance is covered by having a romance that just never leads to sex. That may be the easiest way, but I don't know that that's necessarily the most respectful way. Yeah, I—I I think it's—it's it's something that I've seen increasing amount of interest and in kind of demand for, and um, uh, yeah, I think it's something that we could definitely look at and have one or more writers just kind of research enough to make sure they could do it justice. Yeah, I mentioned in the other panel that part of it has to be, there has to be a writer uh, who wants to tackle that particular topic and thinks that they can handle it. And I, I think we have a pretty adventurous bunch. The, the Dragon Age team is, is, is pretty game when it comes to uh, trying out different things. So I don't doubt that that may happen at some point. Uh, so yeah, it's a, it's a great idea. Come on in front. Terrifying. <laughs> um, so I would be really interested in a diversity of body types in companions and um, anywhere in the Dragon Age universe. Yes. Maybe I can <laughs> probably grab this one. Um, so it's probably another techno technical limitation, unfortunately. Um, we have to create rigs. So our technical animators, they will create, like literally down to the bone count, will create these different rigs, and then we'll animate it. And there are technical limitations around doing that. We can only create so many rigs. We can only create so much variety. Then there's not only the body type, but the customized heads that you have to put on all of these characters. And it's generally a, a time limitation. And then, yeah, just a, a, a budget thing. So we'll we'll offer lots of uh, you know as much option as we can in different body types, you know, we'll a large a large amount of that is based around the races in Dra in, Dra in Dragon Age. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's generally a, a limitation on just how much we can take on in each discipline. Which is not but to that say that we haven't discussed. It. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. yeah, yeah. no, it, yeah, and, and when we're planning, you know, I mean, we uh, several times, you know, in the early stages of some of the Mass Effect development, we could only have one gender or other of the alien races because there was only one, so it's like, well, if you only can have one, why can't it be female? If you can only have one, why can't it be someone who's like the Turians, not this right? big around, yeah. right? So those are really good questions to ask as we're planning and as we're in development. So. And I, I think especially as, um, you know, that's one of the, the tough part about being the, the, you know, the first Bioware game on the new engine is running into those mm -hmm. limitations and having to generate all that content. Uh, what we're really hoping is that uh, future games that are from Bioware on the Frostbite engine can you know, really see more diversity add in that area so that you know, yeah, cause heaven the future... willing, dra you know, Dragon Age 5, the final frontier, or, <laughs> 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 yeah. or whatever, is something where we have a really good diversity of body types. Yeah, and that's one of the great benefits of, um, of all being in the same engine now, is future yeah. projects will be able to benefit from the rigs that we built for DAI. They won't have to build those again. They can just put a new appearance on them, make them a fabulous new character for a future game, and then start building our library of diverse rigs. I will say, though, that I, I, I that, that, that kind of... The thing has to come largely from the art department, and I have heard a lot of interest among the artists in having that kind of diversity. So I think there is definitely a push from below to make that happen in, in time. Yeah, so I've keep, um, keep I've asking had, about that. I've had that exact conversation um, in in uh, Montreal, and and um, I, I know that they're they're definitely interested in it. It's just like everyone said, it, it's just tech wise, but um, next gen and and on Frostbite, there's there's lots of interest. So it's just catching up with the technology. So I think we We're probably only have time for one more. I was getting... One more. One more, yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> I have the power. You win. <laughs> <laughs> All right, mutant and proud. I love it. So 
I bought Dragon Age Origins three years ago, and exactly five minutes later, I was in a car accident, which drastically shrunk my, like I, I'm a social worker, I traveled all over southwestern Pennsylvania, and so for the last three years, I've basically only been able to stay in my house. So I have been romanced by your game, because when I could not leave my house to see my friends, and when I could barely look at a screen, suddenly I was making these friendships that became romances that helped rebuild my confidence after my entire world was shattered. So I just wanted to say thank you for making a product that helped to save my life. Wow. Thank you for telling us that. I mean, uh, uh, of all the things we get, uh, every now and again, uh, I know that we, I will get, for instance, I'm the one who, who's sort of the, the face of the, the writing team, so every now and again, I will get a message from somebody, and uh, that will just sort of underline for us sort of the, the why it feels so good to do what we do and to make the efforts that we do. I, I've had people write me, me and say, uh, your game helped me come out. Uh, your game saved my life. Uh, when I was, you know, your game made me feel better when I was really depressed. And I, I felt like people cared about me, or it made me feel like it was possible for me to be attractive. And and it's it's sometimes tough to read that because it's like I, I, I want to sort of live in a world where the game I make is really just fluffy fun. Uh, but to know that it touches people like that is also really validating for us as artists. So, so thank you very much. It for, makes a lot of long time. nights worth it. So yeah. You're, thank you're you. the reasons you're why we do it. So thank you very much. This is personally one of my favorite conventions and I know David and I, this is our second year here and we love it. And, um, uh, Patrick, Karen, and Robin, um, thank you guys so much. Uh, we are going to be back uh, here, um, I, I think in this exact room, yep, uh, tomorrow at 11 a.m., Freaking Out the Neighbors. So I hope you guys will join us for Freaking Out the Neighbors. Um, and then we'll have a, a, signing, <clears throat> a signing tomorrow. Um, I'm all emotional. No, I, I just have asthma. Um, but <laughs> thank you guys for joining us. If you had any questions or comments, um, we'll, we'll be hanging out outside. Otherwise, um, uh, please enjoy GamerX. This is such an important convention. Um, so many important issues and, and just fun. Uh, just, just fun. Uh, please go give high fives to all the volunteers and uh, the organizers. And um, come chat with us outside. And uh, see you tomorrow at 11 a.m. And if anyone wants to hashtag ride the bull on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs>